it should pop up live. Oh, there we go. We are live, Kevin. I apologize. I don't have my muffin in my can sparkling water, but I think we'll still be able to get through this tonight. <laughs> I'm actually quite glad that you don't have any of those things, Doug. Very, very glad, in fact. <laughs> Man, what a week. Uh, tonight we are going uh, We. You know, thanks everyone for joining. You're, you've got the Two Bros Wrestling Show here. We're back after a, a couple of weeks off, and uh, we're going to be talking about the big uh, Labor Day weekend and the first time ever that NXT, WWE, and AEW all had major pay per views going on in the same weekend. So there was a lot of great action. So we'll give you the highs and the lows of the weekend. Um, but Doug, I'm, I'm pretty sure before we do that, we got a. Here, here's the problem with our show tonight, man. <laughs> Everything we talk about, there, it, it's like it's Rome tonight, man, because it all leads to the end of All Out. And I think that, unfortunately, you know, takes away from a lot of good wrestling this weekend. But, you know, just like the, 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 the media scrum to All Out took away from pretty much everything that happened over the weekend. Um, I don't know, man. Let's just go to the news and let's just try and try and unpack this because there is a lot to unpack this week. There is a lot to unpack this week. Obviously, we're starting with the news that the entire wrestling world cannot stop talking about. And of course, that's the uh, in-ring debut Friday night of the Maximum Male Models. But can you believe <laughs> that Monsoor took the loss uh, in their first? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> AEW Turmoil, CM punk's disastrous media scrum uh with poor tony khan looking like a hostage uh sitting next to him as a foul mouth punk barry colt cabana hangman page the young bucks kenny omega and mjf and then of course after leaving the scrum there was the backstage altercation that uh, everyone has heard about now of course depending on whose side is who started it who instigated some say the elite instigated others said it was punk however apparently the the through line is that Someone threw a chair and hit Nick Jackson in the face. Yep. <laughs> Kenny Omega got bit and got his hair pulled. <laughs> These are consistent from both sides. That you know, he still threw a through it, not a phone, but a steel chair. Steel chair. Of course, it's right. Of course, he's going to throw a steel chair. What else would you use? Right. But and then he bites Kenny Omega and pulls his hair. That <laughs> yes. Folks, that is uh, that is a kind of an agreed upon fact at this point. Kenny Omega, apparently, by most reports, only got involved while he was trying to calm down CM Punk's dog Larry, and uh, it was Larry. that's when he got bit. Not by the dog, mind you, but by a human being. Uh, everyone involved in the incident has reportedly been uh, suspended and or maybe on their way to being fired. Um, all except for, I guess. Uh, Larry the dog escape punishment because he's probably a, a really good boy. Um, <laughs> he was just a victim of circumstance. Man, Doug, this means Kenny Omega, both young bucks, Pat Buck, who's a backstage agent, Christopher Daniels, Michael Nawazawa, uh, Nakazawa, oh. Brandon Cutler uh, were all suspended. We do not know how long they've been suspended. And obviously a still is probably done with the company. CM Punk, depending on who you believe may also be done with the company. Um, at the very least, they are also going to be suspended. Uh, but you know, all the, the titles have all been vacated. All these top belts that they just crowned people with over the weekend have all been vacated with either like uh, a number one contenders match that we already have new trios champions or a tournament in the case of the world title. Uh, Doug, you probably heard this and or noticed this, that Dynamite uh, no longer contains uh, mm -hmm. any of the above mentioned individuals in the opener of the show. And despite the fact that Tony made it to the air talking about how he was forced to do this, um, they never mentioned why and they never even mentioned the names of any of those involved. And that is reportedly because um, there could be possible legal actions coming out of all this. And to the extent that Tony Khan and AEW have hired the services of an independent firm to investigate and do uh, video depositions, uh, essentially, on eyewitnesses. And, if, of course, th if this story couldn't get any crazier, uh, the only one that we definitely know of, other than those involved, who managed to see the whole thing reportedly, is, of all people, MJ. <laughs> 
Doug. I mean, really, what in the world? So actually, I have heard a report. I've forgotten her name, but she is chief legal counsel yes. for AEW. She was apparently also present from what I'm hearing. So that's very interesting <laughs> to get a firsthand uh, account from your legal counsel. Um, and on top of all this, Kevin, CM Punk left the All Out main event injured. <laughs> yes, yes, injured, torn tricep. So no matter what, that title was going to be vacated uh, because he was legitimately injured yet again and would have been unable to continue. Uh, but Doug, not only does this make a mess of the title scene, which has bounced around way too much here lately anyway, with all the interim champions and all the other nonsense, and now you crown champions at your big pay per view only to have to, to to take the titles off of everyone because of this. Um, it, obviously, we've reported now for the last few weeks of an AEW backstage that's in turmoil. But man, that MJF stuff that we all pondered for months just looks like small potatoes compared to what unfolded uh, on Sunday night. So, you know, I've had a lot of people reach out and say, hey, is this a work? Is this a shoot? What's going yeah. on? Like, there's no way this is a work. You don't bury, you know, a huge comeback, a huge return, like like MJF had at that at, at All Out with the media scrum and all this. And then, you know, it comes out this weekend. I was watching some uh, some news today. It was Russell Talk. Uh, They're talking about how Meltzer's reported that Punk a while back said, "Just wait to the, wait to the uh, All Out media scrum." Yeah. Then went into it knowing what he was doing. And if you go back and watch it, which I'm sure you have, and everybody yeah. watching it has. If you haven't, folks, you need to. You know, it's it's a it is a a crash and burn from the get-go. Punk is trying to improv with some dude in the front row who's just not having anything with it, and punk just kind of keeps running with it. At this point, I've got to ask, why in the hell is Colt, Colt Cabana living rent-free in CM Punk's head? what, some 10 years after their friendship disintegrated? It, it uh, you know, you mentioned earlier, Doug, that this is not a work. It not being a work doesn't mean it wasn't premeditated. And Absolutely. after hearing these reports that this was something that CM Punk planned to do, you go back and watch it, you realize, despite how agitated he was, and despite how vehemently he was going on about how you all can't let Colt Cabana go, and I keep having AJ's question, it wasn't anyone in that room other than CM Punk that brought Colt Cabana up. And it almost oh, didn't work because he tried to, like, you know, get an in with one of the reporters who had in the past done some uh, improv work. Improv. Yeah. <laughs> it thought that they were still friends. And when it turns out that, oh, no, we don't get along, Punk was kind of at a loss. Like, you know, it was kind of obvious looking at his face like, well, now you've just blown it for me because I had all this planned and you're not playing along. So he... Just continued on, forcing <laughs> on, even though it made no sense. And then, you know, I think back to <laughs> us in Charleston, right? When Punk yeah. goes into business for himself and we're like, is Punk going heel here? What's going on? And then, you know, there was like pre-all out when Punk comes out and he's cutting a promo and he goes heel again on some guy in the front row who apparently had called out Colt Cabana's name. <laughs> And, you know, even though all of this is naturally focused on CM Punk, who was an idiot. I mean, it was obvious from like, you know, the man's running his mouth in a, in a way that's damaging to the business, his company, his boss, who's sitting right there beside him and making the most hilarious facial expressions. <laughs> like you could literally see him go, you know, <laughs> so like, oh, poor Tony. But uh, we have some other folks here that aren't exactly innocent either, because to your point of what happened in Charleston, after, after you know, Dynamite went off the air and Rampage went off the air, the elites in the ring and Kenny is obviously talking in a way that he knows is going to get out there as well, saying things at the time we're going, huh, that's a little odd. And right. then you realize what he's talking about. These men are airing their dirty laundry against each other in public or semi-public forums in a way that they know will get buzz and things. So there's not, they're not, obviously punk is majority in the wrong, but there's a lot of blame to go around here. Absolutely. There's, you know, and you know, bigger issues with this. If you think about, if you're looking at it from like a legal standpoint, I was talking to a friend about this. You're looking at like, okay, so the young bucks get in a fist fight with CM Punk. Kenny Omega is involved with the fist fight with CM Punk. That's bad in and of itself, but they're more than just coworkers. You have an employee and then three executive vice presidents of a company yeah. fighting with an employee 
that's that's major problems right there major problems is the uh probably even underselling what happened on last sunday night's show and I know we're in a way underselling it because it isn't our main event topic tonight, even though it's the topic on everyone's mind. But uh, we don't know what the legal ramifications are going to be. We only have bits and pieces of people's stories that are continuing to emerge. We don't even know if we should expect any of these people to be back on uh, television uh, or how long any of these suspensions or anything are for. So, Doug, we are going to definitely dig deeper into this. In fact, uh, we're doing a post-Dynamite show, not this week, but in a week and a half from now. Maybe by that time, more will be known as to whether or not uh, CM Punk has has worked out an exit from the company, uh, what these suspensions might be for the elite, as well as regardless of what the latest is, we're going to give uh, an entire uh, hour's worth of uh, our time here on the show to discuss just exactly how we got to here, how Tony got to this point of losing control of his company, and what, if anything, we can do at this point to turn things around. I feel bad, man. <laughs> I just feel bad. I was so excited for Punk to come back. Yeah. And then, and now I really wonder, holy sh! Vince and Triple H may have been on to something with this dude. Well, you know, in related news, or maybe not related news, I should say, uh, we have some other departures uh, that, you know, just easy to look over with all the other news going on. But Malachi Black has supposed, uh, supposedly requested his release from AEW. It has not been granted. Uh, we don't know if any of the backstage drama, um, not particular drama of Sunday night, but just in general, a bad atmosphere backstage have anything to do with Malachi Black. We do hear that he is supposedly not happy with the way he has been booked. Um, Also not happy with the way he was booked and unable to come to terms with AEW on a new contract, even though both sides were interested. Bobby Fish is officially gone from AEW. Although he's willing to fight CM Punk. (laughs) Well, I guess he did bury CM Punk on his way out, so maybe Tony will pony up a little bit of money for that. (laughs) Who knows? Uh, and this is almost definitely related. This, the, maybe a little bit of positive news. Maybe we can give. Uh, let's talk some executive news. Uh, Tony Schiavone has now been elevated to basically Tony Khan's right hand man. And honestly, considering the chaos, um, having someone like you know Tony in Tony Khan's ear, uh, Tony Schiavone lived through the politics and the collapse of WCW. He may be an excellent person with all of his history in the business, especially through. Uh, what he survived there during the the Time Warner years uh, and the merger that ended up being the death of WCW. I think that's a good move, actually. I do, too. I think there's no better person to be Tony's right hand and go, okay, here's where we're going real quick, and we need to do X, Y, and Z to stop this from being WCW 2.0. Well, meanwhile, in the uh, suddenly non-dysfunctional company, (laughs) we have a couple of executive news there, too. Triple H has uh, been promoted already. Uh, he's now the chief content officer just mere weeks after being named the head of creative in this new elevated uh, position triple h will oversee creative writing talent relations live events talent development and creative services and the role will report to wwe co-ceo uh, nick khan probably to keep him from reporting to the other co-ceo who uh there might be some nepotism uh, issues there um but the news the news also on WWE is that uh, Shawn Michaels has also been promoted, um, and he is now the uh, Senior VP of Talent Development Creative. This is essentially continuing his role overseeing NXT, but now is expanding to include oversight of the UK transition and the launch of NXT Europe. And Doug, I, I'm sure you saw the news release as well as I did, and I don't think it was an intentional dig, but it sure does um, um contrast greatly with what's happening in the other major company, but uh, Raw has seen a 15% increase in Mm -hmm. overall viewership, uh, as well as double digit increase in social media engagement since Triple H got the got the book. Yep. Yep. And also, I'm sure you saw this this weekend that, you know, at least the Bucks are now reaching out with feelers to uh, their friends in WWE. (laughs) I, I, yes, I've seen varying reports as to whether or not that is true, but you can't imagine that, uh, at the very least, WWE wouldn't be interested in uh, un- untethered young bucks in the elite at this point. Maybe right. Vince McMahon wouldn't have been, but you know Triple H would have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have, and, and now we have guests. <laughs> hey, Cuddles. Liam. Hi. 
<laughs> you want to talk some wrestling? The two and a half uh, uh, bros in a in a cat show. <laughs> Doug, Pat McAfee is going to be stepping away from WWE for a few months. He's leaving the broadcast booth, at least temporarily. Uh, he's confirmed reports, as they did on uh, Friday night, uh, let you know that Pat is joining ESPN's college football pregame show, College Game Day, for the next two seasons. Dream job for him. McAfee stated that he will return. He's still a member of his family. And then uh, SmackDown, uh, Michael Cole let it be known that Pat will be gone for a few months. So I imagine during the offseason we'll see Pat McAfee. But for the meantime, uh, obviously, he wanted to do both jobs, apparently. But WWE said, hey, uh, too too hard on you, too hard on your family. Just come back. Uh, Again, would that have been a a decision that Vince McMahon would have made? (laughs) Sorry, pal. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's, It's them or us. And then the last bit of news, Doug, I'll mention New Japan Pro Wrestling has announced the launch of New Japan Tamashi. Uh, it's a brand new, uh, it's a new brand that will be based out of its Australian dojo. It'll feature Australian and other regional talent uh, from the sub Pacific region there, uh, alongside of stars from the main New Japan roster. And it'll work similarly to how they do uh, New Japan Strong, which is their American brand that is based out of their dojo in LA. They started out in 2020. And if all of this sounds familiar, uh, it's basically because this is Triple H's old NXT strategy that we're mm-hmm. going to have these regional hubs around the world uh, that's going to cater to these uh, international markets, uh, the regional and local markets, and then blossom those guys up into the main roster. New Japan is just able to uh, enact this plan way faster than obviously uh, Triple H was, considering that Vince McMahon kind of lost faith in that version of, of Triple H's vision. Yeah. And with that, Doug, there was actually some wrestling last weekend. Did you know? There was was so much wrestling last weekend. Just ask Tony Khan. He was pretty upset about that himself (laughs) during the media scrum. When Tony complains about not, you know, when asked if he'd ever worked with Triple H and WWE and saying they probably wouldn't be interested because of, quote, the way they've treated me, he very likely is referring to specifically this past weekend where Tony was not happy that WWE took their big, uh, AEW's big event and decided to run big events opposite. But it's great counter programming uh, from, you know, Triple H's point of view. And, and it's hard to, you know, say that it wasn't a success. Uh, we're going to talk some highs and lows, Doug, and I, I have my notes in chronological order here. So Clash at the Ch- at the Castle did come first, Let's and I will it. say as my first high, uh, just the concept of Clash at the Castle, the idea of having a UK pay per view for the first time uh, in you know since 1992's edition of SummerSlam, uh, it was a big deal. Even if it was a last minute, hey, we're going to you know stick it to AEW concept. Maybe if that had anything to do with it. It still in that giant stadium looked like a million dollars. It looked and like it, a big deal. And the announced team went above and beyond to make it a big deal too, which I thought was kind of cool. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, the, the significance of them returning to to the UK. It's such a big event. You know, it, 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 they really put that over, and I thought they did that very well. And you mentioned the com- commentators. If if I had to switch quickly to a low, I didn't like that Jimmy Smith and Pat McAfee were at home. I understand now maybe why McAfee was. But I've gotten so used to multiple announce teams helping to kind of, in my mind, depending on who's talking, I know which brand I'm watching. Uh, it helps reinforce that brand split. Yeah. That, that line's getting thin anyway of the brand split. Mm-hmm. split. And so when you have the same announced team uh, for the whole night, it didn't do a whole lot to, to keep that straight in your, in my mind anyways, uh, that there is still a brand split. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cause I, I kind of get a, I got a little lost and I wasn't able to watch it live. I had to watch it later in the night. And then I kind of watched an abbreviated version because I, I kept, I had some things going on, <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, it does help to have, was, okay, this is a roll, this is a SmackDown, kind of know where I am. Yeah. But Doug, you mentioned that uh, how the, the announcers made it seem like a big deal. I had in my notes as a high, just all the call outs throughout the show to European wrestling. Mm-hmm. If, if there was a wrestler in the ring that had a history in one of the independent promotions in Europe, they mentioned, hey, this guy worked for Progress for X number of years. He was this champion, that champion. That is, again, that is absolutely something that would have never happened under Vince McMahon. You didn't mention any other championships, much less any other promotions. And they gave the wrestling history of Sheamus and, uh, and you know, 
Drew McIntyre and and, and, it, and it does very good. It's very good brand building too because you have like NXT Europe that you're going to be creating you know, while you transition NXT UK, which you know you're going to have this big show with NXT UK and your you know your NXT 2.0 brand on you know running against <laughs> all out the next night. But you know you, you're building brand there too and build, building history, which I thought was a nice touch. Doug, I I uh, also liked the way that uh, Bailey showed other heels how you react uh, appropriately to turn a crowd back against you. They yeah. wanted to chant for Bailey. They sang the song and all that, and she shut it down by acting like it was bothering her. No, don't do that. Like so many heels uh, lose focus as to what they should do in those moments, and usually just buy into it, play along. Um, but that's how you that's how you shut it down. That's a lesson. That's how you heal. Yeah, yeah, that's how you heal. Bailey was doing a master class for her uh, students. She is uh, taken under her wing there. <laughs> and Doug, I also like that Bailey uh, ended up pinning Bel Air because it, you know, it works on two levels: damage control, new faction needs credibility. They needed to win a lot, lot more than Bel Air's team did. But it also builds eventual title match, obviously between Bianca and Bailey. That's just booking one hundred and one. Maybe you shouldn't need to call that out as a high, but for me. Uh, when you when when things are booked the way that it logically makes sense to book things, that's that's a high. <laughs> and it's sad that so in WWE at this point we're like, wait a minute, they're logically booking things. This makes sense. <laughs> Thank it you, did. Papa Triple. <laughs> Papa Triple. <laughs> Hey, Doug, I also liked and thought it was pretty classy, had it listed as a high, flying Red Hart to Wales and having him in attendance, considering his role in the last time the UK was uh, yeah. involved in the major pay-per-view 30 years ago. And then, of course, Gunther and Sheamus then going out and paying tribute in a ways by stealing the show, just like Brett and, and Davy Boy did that night yeah. uh, for the Intercontinental title. That was really cool. Absolutely, man. I mean, yes. Yes. <laughs> Just yes. <laughs> if I had to spin a, a low off of that match, though, uh, and again, this is sort of a mix. I actually had so many more highs than I did lows, only because it was such a good weekend of wrestling. Um, and Walter reforming Imperium is great and would have made it to my high list if it wasn't for the fact that Walter is still named Gunther. And I've kind of gotten used to it, but I actually had to look it up to see that, oh, wow, Giovanni uh, Vinci, who I've been watching in NXT for months now, is actually Fabian Eichner, and I didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> it wasn't just me then. Yeah, yeah, because it's like it's like the dog hearing a new sound for the first time. It's like, what, what, what am I looking at? Is this Imperium back? Is this real Imperium? What am I seeing here? <laughs> I'm thinking, man, it's great. I love Imperium. That's much better than just having one lackey. Have a stable. Imperium was awesome. And I'm like, yes. oh, it's too bad they couldn't get Fabian Eichner. And then we got Giovanni Vinci. And then I'm like, I'm looking it up. I'm like, oh, crap. I've been watching this guy the whole time. Didn't know it. <laughs> Fabian Eichner. So I was confused by that. I, I have to admit, WWE still confuses me because it's like I'm learning a new product again under Triple H. It's like I'm, I need to pay more attention to what's going on now where I've just blown it off for so long it's like let me catch highlights of like the main event guys and storylines and if there's something that i need to go back and watch or go back and watch it but you know i need to watch a lot more now which i don't have time for anyway <laughs> but you i know had gotten out of the habit of watching nxt because you were uh holding residual resentment against the death of the yellow and black brand absolutely but now the main storylines and the nxt storylines are intermingling and you know, weaving, and obviously that's Triple H is doing because he's always loved the NXT brand, and his best friend is now overseeing it. So there's synergy there between the two, and NXT has been actually good wrestling for a while, and now it's getting really consistent and solid booking as well. So uh, it's it, your schedule's getting tougher, Doug. <laughs> Just get tougher. It, believe me, it is. <laughs> it is. Although there's some, like, throwaway programming, like on Friday nights with AEW, I think I could just do without at this point. <laughs> Which whoever thought that we would hear Dynamite Doug say those words? If it if that isn't uh, proof Tony enough, has, dude, the, Tony has got to get his house in order. He has got to get that house in order. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about. Not yet. Let's, that's not yet. To itself. Doug, yeah. 
<laughs> you got any highs and lows? I know I'm just going here. Uh, yeah, you go, man. You go. You've got you've got a lot more than I've got lined up here. So I have this on my low list. It's what happened in the Mysterios versus Judgment Day la- match. But can we just say that the three amigos should always be a tribute to Eddie and not a way for heels to mock the friends of Eddie? If you are the friends of Eddie Guerrero or date back to that period of time, uh, like a Rey Mysterio does, guaranteed someone's going to do Three Amigos or the Shimmy or something because apparently we can't just keep from, okay, he's been dead long enough, I guess we can make that into a part of the storyline now. I just don't care for it. I don't care for that. Let me tell you a cool Eddie Guerrero story I heard today, man. <laughs> I was watching this piece on, on how wrestlers just don't get along. Of course, we've got Brett and Shawn Michaels. You know, of course, this piece was um, instigated by, you know, everything that's happening in AEW right now. But there's a long list of wrestlers who feel slighted by other wrestlers. Apparently, at some point in the past, Eddie felt slighted and a little bit shot on by Kurt Angle. So he goes backstage, to, you know, try and take Angle down. <laughs> of course, Angle being the Olympic athlete that he is. makes quick work of it. He pins him down. Later, Bradshaw comes up to him and says, what, why did you think you could do that? And then he goes, well, because I'm a dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you love Eddie Guerrero. <laughs> and it should be uh, said that to this day, Kurt Angle considers Eddie one of the better friends he had in wrestling. So they obviously got past that. Absolutely. Eddie realized, oh, wait, that was absolutely nothing. But yeah, my bad. Sorry, Olympic yeah. gold medalist. <laughs> Forgot that's not a work. Yeah. So, but yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 almost cheap heat. You know, it, I mean, it's, yes. it's not almost cheap heat. It is cheap heat. It's like 100%. when you come out and you talk bad about a sports team, the local sports team. And so you get the city wrong. <laughs> you know, it's just cheap heat. And at least with that, I guess no one really died. And in this instance, Eddie really died. So. Yeah. I just, yeah, I, I wish they'd just get past doing that. But it, it will continue to happen, I suppose, as long as there's any connection still to Eddie Guerrero in that ring. Uh, and speaking of, I, I want to talk about his son. Um, <laughs> I'm putting this in my lows, even though to me this is another mixed bag. I liked how they handled Dominic's turn. Uh, we've seen it coming. But when it came, it made sense. And Ray seemed genuinely, genuinely heartbroken and like, you know, how could you wait a minute? What's happening here? Why? No, it's not too late. Let's let's think about this. Right. That's completely the opposite of Billy Gunn, who after like 30 seconds is scissoring with his new adopted kids in the acclaim and quickly moving on. Um, <laughs> the reason I'm putting it as a low is that I just I'm not sure, Dominic, I, I think he needs this. And I like the look already more than you know, I, I think he needs something. I just have a fear that maybe he's not quite ready. So there's something about the growth of, of Dominic that seemed like it stalled at a certain point for me. Um, and he needs to move uh, forward in his career somehow. He does need to move forward. The look to me says like, you know, Olive Garden manager now. <laughs> <laughs> no sense to all of our, uh, all of our art of Olive Garden manager followers out there. But no, man, you know, I love the unlimited breadsticks. Nothing against <laughs> Olive Garden at all. <laughs> but you know, it needs to sharpen that up, you know, a little bit. I, th- I always have thought his face look was kind of like indie wrestler. I mean, he's like head to toe covered up because, you know, he doesn't have the physique or anything. And and again, I am not advocating that you have to be muscle bound because that's what led to, you know, poor Eddie not being with us any longer. That sort of mentality. But it's just at first I was extremely impressed with Dominic. And then mm-hmm. his work just seemed to kind of stall at a certain point. And maybe it was because he's been. Uh, you know, under the shadow of a legend like his dad, maybe it is time for this move. So I like the idea of this turn. I just have a fear that on his own, and you're right, I I think it's a better look personally, but it's still not there. Um, There's maybe the Judgment Day, though, uh, will be a a good influence uh, to to get Dominic to the next level because he he needs it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's good for Dom, you know, (laughs) <laughs> There's just some weird dynamic with yeah, you know, Rip, Ripley in here. <laughs> they need to turn that into a love angle. Uh, you know that they're going to work something with it. I mean, it's right there, man. <laughs> work it. So a big high for me to Seth Rollins' wings because you know, of course, his his style points are always on game. And then he went out and had a great match with Riddle to boot. So right. nothing but praise there. Um, 
yeah, Rollins, yeah, I, you know, just you know, going back to where you know Rollins kind of it not even broke character, but just kind of like you know, you saw in the promos leading up to it where you know they're in different places in the arena or whatever, they're cutting their promos, and Rollins drops the the like anime villain persona for just a second talks some serious trash right into the camera to riddle and he's like i'm done we talked about my family let's talk you know i love that build up to this and then it should be said the original bro also dropped the bro bit business yep. and started to like you know throwing f-bombs like he was uh, uh cm punk at a sitting next to tony khan eating a muffin uh <laughs> You know, no matter what we talk about, it is always going to be coming back to that. Always. It's always, always going to be coming back to that. <laughs> um, getting to the main event of, of, of WWE's big show, I love that Drew's intro package showcased his journey back all the way to his ties with British wrestling. I think that was great. Definitely a high for me. Um, so, I will say as a low, though, I don't – it's a unified title now. Give the man one, one belt. I, I'm tired of seeing Roman with two belts. Yeah. This exactly, because going into this, regardless of how good Drew was going to do, this is a unified title. It wasn't split off. It wasn't you get this belt or you get it was you're going in for the unified title. This was the perfect, perfect place to break off one of those titles, give it to Drew, give him his moment in front of an actual audience i mean this guy carried us through you know the the pandemic you know no audience era you know as a champion and did never got his victory there i mean he got the belt sure in front of an empty empty like sound stage this would have been a perfect time but going into it we were it was already telegraphed reigns yeah. is coming out I'm cool with Reigns coming out on top. I don't have a problem with that. I want to see, no, I want I get to see it. this lengthy run. I do want to see that because when somebody does defeat him, it's going to be super special. But that could have been Drew for at least one of those belts right here and right now. It, it's, that crowd was so hot. That match was so good. So good. So good. It's so good. They, they really complement each other. You'd think almost that they would be too much of the same kind, being too yes. big but they don't. They have that chemistry. Uh, we saw it a few years ago when they were on different brands and they had the, uh, oh, what was it? The, one, the Survivor Series where they sometimes will have SmackDown versus Raw. That was sort of a teaser. And at the time, we almost had like chills afterwards, like, yes, more of this, please. Like down the road, these two are going to make magic together in a program. And and they, they do. Every time they touch, something special happens. I think that was actually the best match they ever had. Um, it was great. It was epic. Man, it felt like a big deal, too. That crowd was hot. So many people crammed into there. Um, I loved, this is on my like list, but Reigns planting the seeds for the future by giving a rock bottom. I don't know I've ever seen him do a rock bottom before. I and he actually called it a rock bottom on first reference. And then when they showed the replay, they call it a, a, a Uranagi, which I thought, oh, they're, they're just baiting us now with that whole they are. Yeah, they're they're baby. Baby. So I, was, I was having this discussion with my nephew about the plan being for Reigns Rock at WrestleMania. I said that was always the plan when Vince was in charge. I don't necessarily know that's the plan now, but you know, what, catching up on some news this weekend, it sounds like that's still the plan as long as Rock is available. But, you know, I guess the plans are for Roman not to drop any belt until late summer next year. So we get past that just in case we can have a, a, a Rock a, a, Reigns match at WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can't say that if if I was running the show, I, that that's you know, Vince wasn't wrong about everything. I mean, exactly, and apparently Triple H is still on board with that yeah. plan for Vince as long as Rock is available. That it being Rock Roman at WrestleMania, yeah, uh, uh, but still Roman not losing anything, and it doesn't make sense for Rock to win something, you know, win the Universal titles at WrestleMania. I mean, yeah. he's that's the only thing that that's the only hitch in the plan in my mind is that much like the two uh, title belts is that mm -hmm. would we even imagine even for a short run dropping it a, a, a pay-per-view a month later that they would actually give rock a title at this point in time. Um, exactly. it, it, it telegraphs it just, just like the cast, clash of the castle match. Yeah. Drew's not winning. Rock's not going to win <laughs> just because, you know, just because, just but, because, 
But my goodness, it was such an excellent match. And really a weekend of excellent wrestling. Now I did not I have not seen the NXT. So when we get to that, you're going to have to you're going to have to like give me the cliff notes so I can go back and know what I need to watch and not watch. And I'm pretty sure you're gonna tell me I need to watch the whole thing. It's <laughs> but, pretty good. Yeah. We're actually I'm almost to that because I we are in the main event of Clash. I will say, and I want your opinion. I had it on my high list, but I'm curious what you think. I thought it was an excellent way. I don't like shenanigans in main events. I get it, but sometimes it makes booking sense. Uh, it was a great match anyway. Um, introducing a new member of the bloodline that way on a big stage, I, I thought it was great. I liked Solo Sokoa coming in to legitimately, folks, another son of Rikishi and younger brother of the Usos. Uh, I thought that was awesome. I thought it was really cool. I, although, you know, again, I didn't watch Classic of Cashel during the day. I watched it really late that night. So this old man may have fallen asleep and woken back up a few times. But I don't remember a stipulation to keep the Usos away. I, maybe I missed that somewhere. But Hey, it wasn't an Uso, man. It was a different <laughs> Uso. Well, that's what it was. Cause, you know, I'm pretty sure an announcer said something about there being no Usos around. You know, Jimmy and Jay weren't around, but, you know, their little bro shows up. Nor honorary Ooze, who is like killing me right now. <laughs> exactly. Okay, real quick. Honorary Ooze is soon going to come around to Babyface. Oh, side yeah. with KO and take those belts, or at least split that, split those titles up, those tag team titles up. That's happening. That they are planting the seeds for that, or at least I'm armchair booking and saying that. In the interim, though, watching Sammy do his obnoxiously bad dancing on his way to the ring, <laughs> mugging with the Usos, and then having this like you know uh, difficult relationship that they're working on apparently with with uh, Jimmy. <laughs> Or is it Jay? One of the twins. I can't remember now. One of them is, hey, he's the thing is, is now, now, now you've got another legit blood member of the bloodline there. It's just a matter of time before oh, Sam yeah. gets beat down. KO comes to the rescue. And then we've got, you know, Steen and El Generico going after belts. <laughs> oh, the, I will, I will, I'm glad that you also like the Solo Sokoa thing. I will say uh, if there's one uh, bad that I give to the, the uh, Castle main event is that if the ending there at the, the post-match stuff was to tease some sort of Roman uh, Tyson Fury uh, interaction for later, or maybe even an Austin Theory Tyson Fury thing for later. Uh, I'm not interested. So I saw this thing where not Jimmy Spitz. Oh my goodness, Freddie Prince Jr. <clears throat> was talking about. Uh, was I just saw the headline of Freddie Prince Jr. confirmed that the uh, end of Clash of the Castle was somebody not cutting the cameras. That uh, was for, that apparently was not for us. At least the pre according to the headline, that wasn't for us. I was I didn't have a chance to read the whole article. I just saw the headline, Freddie Prince Jr. confirms Clash of the Castle ending was, you know, not not for a uh, viewing audience. So now, I, I that that makes me feel better because I know he's a big deal in the world of boxing and a, a big deal in his home country. But to see him in the WWE ring work a program, I know he's been sort of WWE adjacent for a while now. He's right. a fan, which I respect, but I don't need to see that. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't need to see that. Don't want to see that. You know, we talked about the celebrities before. Unless it's McAfee or Bad Bunny, <laughs> or Jake Paul or Logan, whichever Paul is in the WWE now, because these kids can go. Hey, so, and I'm also fine for him just punching out Austin Theory to keep him from, uh, uh, you know. Putting in his uh, bid for the title by uh, cashing in his his contract there with uh, the briefcase. I think that's kind of a funny uh, through line that every time he tries to do it, something happens before he can. I'm yeah. fine if we just leave it at that. Um, yeah. and, and happy to think that the, the rest of it may have been just uh, for the folks there in, in England and not for our eyes. Right. That's that's my understanding of what it was. It's kind of like the media scrum. It wasn't for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> not everybody should have saw that. <laughs> So it was like a weekend of really good wrestling with really questionable post wrestling things going on. A lot of questionable post wrestling things going on. Um, going to move quickly through NXT, Doug, especially since you didn't see it, but give you a little bit of get comfy for this. So. Yeah, sit back, get comfy. So I'll start with a low because there was more highs than lows. It was a nice tight two hours, so it's an easy to watch program. They didn't overstay their welcome or any of that. But I honestly thought Worlds Collide deserved better than being at the Performance Center. So even though the main roster is in uh, Europe, 
uh, legitimately. And you could have flown those folks to Europe. You should have flown them to Europe. Yeah. Uh, nothing against the Performance Center, but it's the same backdrop we always see on their weekly TV show. And it would just have given it a bigger show feel had they been in front of a different crowd. And it also would have been a way to reward your UK audience with one more NXT UK show because the last NXT UK show that fans viewed, they didn't know they were watching the last NXT UK show at the time. Um, right. So that's a, a, a tiny negative for me. But as far as a, a high goes, uh, man, right decision, right decision to start the pay-per-view proper uh, proper with uh, Ricochet versus uh, Carmelo Hayes. Unbelievable high note. One of the best matches of the entire weekend. Raised, raised, they do this mid-air collision, Doug, that you have to see. They both spring from the middle rope as they are whipped into opposite sides of the ring and collide in the middle with a uh, both attempting a crossbody at the same time. And the timing on that uh, was just one of the many things. It was like watching a video game encounter between these two. Absolutely incredible. So the description sounds like two guys just floating in zero G <laughs> trying to fight. Pretty much, pretty much. Uh, I will say also that was the best match of the show. So watch the first match especially. Uh, but the, the tag team uh, title match was great too. Um, and I'm calling out specifically Julius Creed's core strength. Uh, we've seen these spots or similar versions of these spots before where your strong guy sits there holding a move up and then does something amazing like, you know, instead of just suplexing him, I'm on the bottom rope and I suplex him from the outside or or I go down to one knee, but I, I maintain the suplex and I get back up, you know, those kind of moves. I've never seen this. He was holding his opponent in a suplex position and then somehow ends up getting dropped down completely seated, but he did not lose the suplex. So he is on his backside, still holding the suplex, and from that position manages to stand all the way back up and never once even looked like he was tilting him forwards or backwards, had him the whole time and finished off his suplex, never lost it. Absolutely unbelievable uh, show of strength. And it is almost like a uh, Claudio thing in that there's much bigger men but uh, Julius Creed is a legit, uh, obviously, core monster here. That that sounds very interesting. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah. that, that spot alone is, is worth uh, uh, seeing. Um, I will say also for Lowe's, I would have preferred it if they would have taken this pay-per-view and had all the unification matches only be amongst the champions. So mm -hmm. like the tag team title match I just referenced was actually a four-way elimination match. So you had two non-championship tag teams in there and like uh, Briggs and Jensen, the actual champions were the first ones eliminated. Uh, even worse than that was the women's title match where instead of just having it a one-on-one, -on -one, it was a standard uh, three-way contest. So first victory has it. Uh, Blair Davenport's inclusion pretty much gave away. She was going to take the, the loss. It also cheated us out of a, a Mako Satamora, Mandy Sachs, champion versus champion one-on-one -on -one matchup, which I get. I guess they're trying to keep both strong. Uh, right. The match itself was probably the best Mandy's ever had. It was like the like a great match. It's just – Everyone knew Blair Davenport was just there to take the loss. So if you're going to have a unica unification match, having these outsiders or people that weren't champions involved, uh, kind of a low for me. So this this did unify th this whole whole uh, premium live event did unify all the NXT UK and the NXT 2.0 titles, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep, they did. So we have one set of champions now, which. I imagine it is yeah, yeah. one set of champions of people running around with multiple belts now, like Reigns. What, yeah. what is going on there? Is it is it like a unified championships now, like NXT championships? Or we will see because we okay. haven't had much post follow up yet. Um, okay, but, uh, yeah, hopefully they go the route of uh, we've put. I think the way they're calling them now is just NXT champion. Okay. So you're the NXT champion. And that way you don't have to say NXT world champion or NXT UK champion. You're just NXT, whatever flavor of NXT you are. Maybe they keep, who knows what they'll do with Europe. Maybe they'll keep that and have a European version of the you know, like European champion or something. NXT Europe, European championships. And then these titles, like the UK is not like, it's not a unified UK. It's just NXT champions. Okay. Sorry, I'm just spoiling. Well, you know, even, if, even if we know, you know, this might be also, Doug, a giveaway that uh, NXT Europe isn't happening in January. It might be later on into next year uh, right. for them to go ahead and just basically get rid of one set of titles the way they did. Um, I will say I love to have it on my high list, the video entrance of Tyler Bates. Uh, he literally, literally walked through the entire history of NXT UK because he was the first 
inaugural yeah. champion as a teenager and it walked through every champion and you're seeing Pete Dunn and Walter and just like realizing how many under the radar moments that it makes. <laughs> you mean Butch and Gunther? <laughs> exactly. I mean, we're talking a lot of main event talent now uh, that uh, uh, folks that are around or upper mid cards or getting closer to that on the main roster uh, that came out of the UK. And so watching him walk through that, uh, all, literally from a boy to, you know, a 25 year old, the first and now, as it turns out, the last champion. Wow. Perfect. And even though we all knew the unification would probably go Breaker's way, a big tip of the cap to NXT and both Bates and, and Breaker for putting those moments of doubt in your mind. They put on an, a great performance. I'd say, Doug, check out the first match, Ricochet and Carmelo Hayes, as well as the last match, that dramatic kick out. Uh, of the Tyler Driver 97 uh, by Breaker. I'm sitting there popping for it, even though I knew Breaker's obviously Mr. NXT, the poster boy. But Tyler Bates is amazing. Probably Bates working is- with someone like Bates helps Breaker also have the best match. Breaker's amazing in his own right, but this was a next level. This was a step up for Breaker, and I think it's because of you know rising to the opponent as much as anything. That's cool because you know Breaker Breaker is great. That Steiner kid I think is amazing. He has a rocket strapped to his back, and I've always loved Bates' work. So, definitely from the beginning and the end, Doug. If I have to say it, it, they they delivered. And okay, cool. Big time delivering. Uh, I I want one more. I guess maybe uh, Breaker getting booed maybe was a bit of a low Uh because he is the face of of the future of of the brand. Uh Maybe a low for the booking staff uh, to to not anticipate this, but I'm sure they thought, hey, we're not in the UK. We're at the Performance Center. We're in Breaker's backyard, and, and fans are g- crazy about Breaker. I think they underestimated how much people love Tyler Bates because the crowd was definitely pro Bates. So did the fans boo at the end when Breaker comes up as champ? Oh, okay. Or just during yeah. the match? During okay. the match. They obviously wanted, uh, the, it went from like a, a, a 50, 50 split of like, who do we go for to that crowd? Even though he was on, uh, Breaker's home turf, that crowd wanted Tyler Bates. Okay. Well, yeah, that, that speaks, I think that speaks volume of Bates talent right there. And that hopefully keeps him around in the you know regular NXT roster uh, a little more. Um, moving on, Doug, to AEW. Uh, we, want to do, we want to do some lows on this first, and this is maybe that line of like uh, uh, you know it's a thin line sometimes between giving people a value for their money and then maybe just too much of a of a good thing. Uh, you know, we, I'm gonna, this AC is really loud. Let me turn this sure. off. So Doug and I uh, talked a few weeks ago about seeing AEW live, and it's a great value for the money when they tape Rampage and Dark beforehand. But it still was a long show at four hours, and but we're we're you know there in the in the midst of being uh, entertained in person. Um, when you have a pre-show start and then give people four hours after that, and you almost had to watch the pre-show. Doug, they had two title matches on the pre-show. Yes. And so it's five plus hours of wrestling that burns out a live audience a bit. But it certainly burns out a uh, at home watching audience that doesn't have that a live adrenaline like you and I had. At least those shows for the home viewer were split up into four nights, or <laughs> right. But you know, I mean, you put a confused old Mark, you know, up until like two in the morning after you watch the media scrum, which it became must see viewing too. <laughs> the real match of the weekend wasn't even there. I'm, I was just so happy I didn't have to go to work the next day. <laughs> The pre-show, I will say that it's bad because it, it not only had two title matches, but um, they were relegated to the pre-show. Uh, Tomohiro Ishii and Eddie Kingston had a chop fest worth checking out. One of the highs of the weekend, and it was on the pre-show. Totally did. And, you know, the, that's a match that, you know, kind of got thrown together because Eddie Kingston and Sammy Guevara had backstage issues, which led to Sa- uh, Eddie getting suspended for a couple of weeks and then the program they were working up to, you know, that fell apart. So, I mean, great consolation prize for, uh, for Eddie there to go against the, you know, the, the you know, Tomohiro Ishii. <laughs> but yeah. and while we're on the pre-show, Doug, I will say, uh, and I put this in my lows. Uh, I don't like the concept of mixed tag titles. Sorry. Uh, I'm indifferent to it. I mean, it, 
other than the uh, other than the one man and woman uh, that was uh, defending against the one man and woman uh, that were the challengers that night, what what are the other teams in the uh, that mixed tag division that we need to be keeping our eyes on? I just don't like the idea of like uh, male female tag teams. Right, and it, and that, that's the triple. A. Is that the triple A? Yes, intergender tie. Yeah, and, and Sammy and Tay, Tay have that. So yes. I don't know. Maybe it's bigger in triple A. And I'm sure it is, and it's more you know acceptable in Triple A. They for years have had intergender matches, even uh, not just mixed champions, right. but men versus women matches. I, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe I'm not as progressive as I think I am because that's just one area. I'm like you know, we're we're fine to not have this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one more pre-show low for me, and that is just way too much uh, offense given to Angelo Parker in his match against Hook. Uh, he shouldn't have been the first person to get that much offense in on Hook uh, mm -hmm. to that extent. And I will also say it slightly exposed Hook a little yeah. bit to yeah. show that he's just a tad bit green still. We know he's going to be big, uh, but not all of his sales or the taking of his, the moves uh, look very smooth. So maybe his defense isn't uh, quite there yet. There yeah. may be another reason why he's running through people in quick matches like butter uh, more than just, uh, you know, trying to build that character as a guy that, that can beat you fast. They may have a strategic reason why they, they do that as well. Yeah. They may be going the Goldberg route there. I think, I think he will exceed Goldberg, you know, by leaps and bounds, but yes. you know, it, it's a little bit of Goldberg booking when you look at it and you see, and you see that, that FTW match there. So, Total, totally agree with you. Um, and then to the to the pay per view proper, proper all out pay pay per view <laughs> proper. Right decision to start it with, in my mind, with the Casino Battle Royal. By that point, because of the counter booking of WWE, much to Tony's chagrin, there had been so much wrestling and so much really good wrestling. Uh, the Casino Battle Royal is a match really distinct from all the matches that would have preceded it over the previous two days. So it probably was a good way to start. Um, but I will say, also on the negative side, uh, ending uh, the way they m did that match seemed to just confuse the audience. Um, so here, here's my thing about that. Right now, I can't tell you who was in the Casino Battle Royal. I can tell you who won it yeah. <laughs> and how it was won, but I can't for the life of me tell you who was actually in it. Well, because it's a lot of spots, uh, quick exits, and, you know, a whole bunch of chaos, sometimes signifying nothing. I mean, I hate to say it, it is very different than anything that preceded it. And then the crowd was really hot for all the action as it was going on. But then you have Stokely, uh, who fans I don't think know well enough yet, with W. Morrissey, who fans might remember or may not, if you're not an Impact fan watching him recently. The guns I get, guns were already kind of in uh, the stable with Stokely. Right. Uh, and then here comes a mask guy who, as we understand why now at the end, why they did it the way they did. But for the ending of that match, it kind of went flat because you had a hot crowd suddenly going, what was that? That was an anticlimactic way to end that. Uh, the crowd went pretty silent, I thought. The crowd went pretty silent. But, you know, watching them watching home for me, I was like, okay, that's. That's MJF MJFing above and beyond. That's pantom MJF pantomime MJF to make it clear that it is MJF. All of his MJF mannerisms are very exaggerated at this point to get over that. Oh, yeah, this is MJF, but you're not going to see it just yet. But, I mean, maybe that was just me. <laughs> So we, we also, though, uh, I guess uh, maybe call out now and say that, um, you know, a high – uh, if you're, I, I, I don't see him watching now, but uh, a hi to to uh, David Poole, who, if you're watching this on replay, uh, had <laughs> foreshadowed. Who's <laughs> blown up our Facebook about this call? <laughs> I think even he was surprised, to be quite honest, that he was right. Uh, I believe this was a situational, uh, I'm paying you to do this for me. I don't believe that this is MJF's new stable because there was no continuation of that, but it was pretty hilarious. And thank you, David Poole, for not only uh, being right, but for calling it to a, uh, our attention just how right you are. <laughs> Appreciate you, friend of the show. Uh, but I just, uh, I thought that was absolutely hilarious. Uh, so yeah, definitely a high. It was David Poole being a, a prognosticator Agreed. there. Agreed. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go low, Doug. Uh, the the, I'm sorry, man. 
I just don't like the even the idea of trios titles. Um, I know I've already dissed the uh, mixed titles, and that's a whole different thing. But trios are too chaotic. There's not enough. Uh, one, I know AEW has stables, but there's not necessarily enough to always keep it interesting. They all end up breaking down into just spot fest. And I'm fine for trios matches on occasion, but I didn't really need trios titles. So I, I'm going to have to disagree with you because I do love trios titles. I love that concept. I think it's great that, you know, the elite were the inaugural for about 20 minutes champions. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 Cause there, and I love a good stable war and this, you know, gives stables something more to fight for, which I think is good. And I think that's very cool because there are so many trios where you can, I mean, you've got dark order, you've got best friends, you've got death triangle, you had the elite, yeah. You know. AEW has more than most. That's that. Normally, you don't have that. I mean, you think back to like the old days. I remember when I was a kid and they introduced six man titles for the NWA. I'm like, Are the Freebirds just going to always fight the Von Erichs, and that's it. Because I mean, they just didn't have a lot of that going around. AEW helped. at least has a, a, you know, like you said, they have multiple three men stables. Um, I just personally trios are my thing. I will say though, it was it made my high list as far as matches go. Oh, they did a nice job with the storyline of Hangman Page working with Dark Order after having first turned down the Bucks. And yeah. then, of course, the story that's there of Hangman uh, Omega 2 when they found, like, all of that was extremely well done. Very well done. I expect nothing less than what we got out of out of all of those guys. Yeah, I hated that Alex Reynolds, you know, got hurt during that match, you know, because I really like Reynolds and Silver. I like Evil Uno. <laughs> You know, I like the Dark Order, <laughs> but they just keep losing members. I think Andrade is going to pluck 10 soon. Anna Jay's off with uh, the JAS. Yeah, because uh, and Cole Cabana apparently is being <laughs> <he's managed>. uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to eat my muffin now, Kevin. You're talking about Cole Cabana. <laughs> muffin down, Doug. <laughs> Bring Larry the dog in here and make a man bite you. Um, <laughs> crazy. Oh. I will give a low though during, uh, but a kind of a funny low during the trios match of Taz not helping sell the storyline of Kenny only pretending to be hurt or any way rusty. I mean, yeah. Excalibur and Don Callis tried to set it up by like, yeah, there have been some reports of uh, Kenny maybe not like looking so. And Taz is like, I haven't noticed anything. But like, way to no sell it. Like, <laughs> right. I imagine he's being yelled at in his headset at that moment, Doug. <laughs> And we see how hyper Tony is at shows. <laughs> so I can't imagine what's yelling in his ear. Especially when uh, poor Tony's been on edge as much as he surely had to be. Oh, and if Tony only knew what was coming later that night. <laughs> if only he knew. Oh, my goodness. Doug, it was great uh, to see the Motor City Machine Guns being presented to a bigger audience. If you yeah. don't know Motor City Machine Guns, you know them through the their amazing work and time in Impact Wrestling, or maybe their time in Ring of Honor on the Independence. Uh, I know it was a one night thing, but it was really cool to see a team uh, that really uh, are very defining of this last generation of tag wrestling to see them getting a little bit of their due in front of a big crowd. Absolutely. Although I think it muddies the waters when you've got Kip Sabian and Kip Sabin. <laughs> that just gets everything really muddy there. It does get a little confusing for sure. Um, I also really liked, uh, and how could you not give a high, the, the uh, Dax's eight-year-old daughter, got a great moment. I mean, fought like an eight-year-old girl. I mean, that's just, one, it's an amazing, true story. And boy, she looks like daddy too. <laughs> I, I, I do. I, I've got to say, you know, there's a, there. Somebody should have said something about where Joe's actually been, you know, instead of like an offhand comment, you know, that we get on on Rampage this, you know, on Friday night. Agreed. That's a low. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, acknowledge <laughs> where Joe's been. <laughs> At least say something about it on air during the time he's been away, because it looks like Joe's just been completely taken out. And I'm sorry. You know, Doug. Did you just uh, say I, that, that one of the wrestling companies isn't appropriately acknowledging uh, their Samoan? Yes, I did. <laughs> I thought, I thought that was Samoan submission machine. <laughs> oh, Doug, uh, a low for me. The crowd is so hot for Ricky Starks. So I'm not sure it was smart booking or why they made the decision to not even have a competitive match 
uh, crowd was pretty quiet when Hobbs uh, won so easily. They mm-hmm. wanted they wanted Starks. I, I I mean you know you could look at it as them building Starks as a baby face now, man. So the baby face is always going to have a better journey if it's a struggle, if it is an uphill battle. But I don't know about that booking, dude. <laughs> A hundred percent agreed. I mean, it just seems so very strange to me. And I realize when I'm looking back at the highs and lows, honestly, the the tape review was really good overall. But most of my lows um, is basically related to the to the booking. Uh, I hate to say it, but there was some convoluted AEW booking. I don't know if he's so distracted with his backstage drama, but there was uh, way too many matches without distinct face versus heel dynamic. Uh, Dark Order versus the uh, uh, Elite. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously the crowd wanted uh, Starks and, and and didn't get him. You had, uh, uh, at least outside of Chicago, and before what happened at the press conference, uh, you had sort of also face versus face in that main event for the home viewer. Yeah. But to me, I think the worst outcome of, of this whole like face versus face is that they basically forced Swerve in his glory to become heels by – putting them in a position to get booed heavily versus uh, the acclaim heavily because it, of the it, it, it seems like they've been flirting with with swerve yeah uh, it's almost like they're trying to tease the, some sort of legit breakup with you know, swerve and our glory because swerve is always the aggressor going up yeah. against like any competitor where you know keith lee's playing like you know smart hulk he's professor hulk in all this yes. and he's like no we need to kill dude it's gonna be fine you know let's give them their due let's give them their chance and then after everything's said and done it's like good game kids good you know and swerve's like nope not having it what are you doing come on stop shaking your hand you know they're it I don't want to get on I'll see him punk and say somebody's stepping on their genitals here with storylines. But, you know, things are getting in the way where you're trying to tell, uh, you're, you're getting ahead of yourself telling a story here and making, I, I don't know, there's mistakes with AEW right now. And I love AEW. It pains me to say this. My phone's going to be blowing up any minute. Tony's going to be calling and going, duh. I think he's preoccupied now. I think you're off his radar for the time being. No, dude, he watches the show just like Vince does. <laughs> well, Vince has time now. <laughs> Can we say, though, a high, even despite that convoluted booking? They lost the match, but the acclaim won the night. Yo, absolutely. Everybody loves the acclaim. I mean, they seriously do. That's not just a catchphrase. The acclaim are so over right now. Like, that's one thing you can't mess up. Or shouldn't be able to mess up. Maybe I should. Well, <laughs> let's see how that goes. <laughs> hey, Doug, I'm happy for Tony Storm. We're all big fans of Tony Storm on here. But in my low column, I'm just about sick of interim champions. Simply Man. vacate the title due to injury and crown a new champ. The former champ can always pick up a feud after returning from injury. We don't need all of these champs versus interim champs to unify one bonus title, as it were, into one legit title. Just say, hey, due to injury, we have to crown a new champion. When that person comes back, they could say, I never lost that title, and fall right back into a feud. Let's stop having these multiple belts. So a few weeks ago on this show, I said, no, I'm cool with the interim. You know, I, I, I'm cool with this concept. I agree with you, man. Thunder Rosa, CM Punk, you know, I mean, had Punk not lost his damn mind, you know, <laughs> after all out at that media scrum, knowing that he has to go into it and have like a surgery that has like an eight month recovery, would Tony have created and uh, had a turn right around and done another interim championship? Probably would have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably would have. I don't like that now because, you know, sparingly, I thought it was okay. You know, I it was all right, but you know, it's like an AEW crutch at this point. Interim champ, interim champ, interim. Yes, stop yes. It. Well, let's stop, stop it. it. And while we're on things that are overdone, Doug, I have it on my low list. Can we just say that there have been way too many attempted swerves and back and forth for the Luchasaurus turn to be anything but like, now what? Like, the, why? Like, didn't you just turn him like two weeks ago? Uh, it, and again, this may have been one of the more hotly anticipated and well booked matches of the night, and yet they either cheated us out of it because of a regular injury. If he really was too injured to wrestle, Christian too injured to wrestle Jungle uh, Boy. Exactly. Why yeah. did they? Why did they continue to push 
that match or give him give Luch, not Luchasaurus, give Jack Perry a yeah. legit squash win there. I mean, the the booking of Luchasaurus throughout all this has been really clumsy. It's like, yes. no, he's a good guy. You know, <laughs> that's been the whole thing the whole time. And they did a great job of making this personal. People actually were looking forward to this. If it was injury or even if it was time, hey, we have to cut something short. Why this match? Just save it and for Dynamite if you have to and, and make it what it should have been. Uh, this was a big low point for me because that match was something that uh, I was looking forward to. I was looking forward to seeing Christian get his comeuppance, and we didn't even get a match. We didn't get a match, but kudos to Jack Perry for taking that power bomb onto the pyro grid and getting well, like he did. You know, yeah. totally selling that. My goodness. Um, Doug, I'm going to end with a, a high and a low on the main event itself. Uh, despite the, the despite everything, forgetting all the drama that would come after, the main event itself was very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a great job, Punk and, and Moxley did a uh, great job. It would, though, in my mind, have been even stronger if not for the decision that undercut uh, the match by having that virtual squash match in Cleveland just two weeks before these two had built such a great story and a hot feud. People were waiting to see them in an official match and not just a brawl. And the first time they should have touched in an official capacity should have been on that pay-per-view. And yet you, you undercut punk by having him come out there, having just been squashed uh, only a week and a half, before, which again, is just one more title turn. And Doug, AEW used to be the kings of, of making sure their champions look strong by keeping it on, on them for a while. So here's my thing about that. I've thought about this long and hard because, <laughs> you know, I, I want to be able to defend my, my, uh, my new black and gold, as it were. <laughs> but, and, I, and I've read a lot where Mox, that, that whole squash was Mox's idea, right? So I think if Mox squashed Punk that decisively with, you know, the whole like, hey, I've got a new foot. It's 100 percent, but I'm not used to it. It's 100 percent. That's that's a super bizarre angle anyway. But you have Mox squash. You have Mox coming off so dominant like that to re and then you have a still come out. You build Punk back up in Chicago. Right. And then you have him triumphantly take that from Mox after being beaten the way he was, that's a really a good story. It's it's a rush story. You know, it's absolutely a rush story, which should not happen in AEW. You know, that's that's more of like, you know, some hot shot booking from like old school WWE that we've been used to for the last 15, 20 years. But I understand at least what they were trying to do there, or at least in my mind to make it make sense to me what they were trying to do there. And it could have worked had Punk not had his muffins after the match. <laughs> Would it, before even the muffins, could it have worked better for this old Mark if instead of another title change, if that squash match would have been Punk returning for a belt he never lost, John Moxley, your current champion, retains the title instead of flipping the title yet again because, hey, my foot, you know, I wasn't ready. It came back too soon. You could have done that without having one more line on the title history that is going to be just days apart from him being stripped now of the title. Just, I mean, it, obviously you couldn't have foreshadowed what was about to happen afterwards. But to me, I would have loved to have not seen that Cleveland match so soon, like you said, rushed. Again, for me, most of the lows, booking problems. The main event itself was great. The crowd mm -hmm. was into it. They told a good story. Um, you know, the post-match return of MJF was something that fans had really looked forward to. That has to be a high as well. Absolutely. But unfortunately, as Doug put it, had his muffin. Doug, that's a lot of wrestling. That's three pay-per-views worth of high and lows we talked about. And that wasn't even the match of, of uh, the weekend. The big fight of the weekend was something that none of us got to see on our screens. Um, let's go big finish. Let's go big finish. So, so yeah. go ahead, go <laughs> right ahead. Cause I have a feeling that we're going to go the same way. So here's what I'm going to do, man. I, I'm going to end on a very positive. Right. And, uh, first off, I'm going to go with a botch. Yep. I'm going to first. <laughs> and, and, and my botch is, is that media scrum, you know, it, it, that it didn't happen in ring, you know, Dude had it planned, clearly. Dude 
was doing it had come, you know, it did not matter. He was going to do what he did. He had, he thought he had somebody who was going to be an unknowing participant <laughs> who shot him down time and time again. <laughs> but Is he Punk just keeps going, you know. Awkwardly drinking water and making faces like, oh, like he was physically hurting poor Tony. It was like I mean, poor Tony. Poor Tony. Uh, man, I, I, it, it, there was a botch there for Tony, too. As, yeah. you know, a, a, as a leader, and I, I'm sure it's not the first conflict Tony has had. You know, Tony's probably calculating the millions of dollars he's going to be losing if he, you know, how, how depending on how poorly this goes. You know, and if he stops Punk now, he's he's probably knows enough about Punk and has seen Punk to know. Well, this just goes poorly anyway. And then Punk even shuts him down a few times when Tony tries to take some ownership of it and try and redirect Punk. But you know, Punk says, "Nope, not your not your place to do anything." Like. Yeah, it's my company. <laughs> you know, there there could have been a way to try at least try and shut that down. It could have it could have went in, it could that even could have went sideways. But that whole thing a complete botch, complete botch, man. Mine very related, not necessarily the scrum itself, but just botch of the week goes to CM Punk, Tony Khan, the Elite, uh, because you know you're an executive VP. You don't need to be on camera just saying, hey, get in here on me. You guys in the back follow that. That's antagonizing. Maybe someone's mm -hmm. more in the wrong, but that's not what you want senior management to do either. Or go afterwards and kick down doors and get in a fight with an employee. Like, no, AEW in general botched it this week. No one came out of this looking good. It was an embarrassment uh, yeah. to pro wrestling and especially to the company at a time that Tony is wanting to go out there and ask for more money from a TV provider and you don't have your own house in order, all the way around a botch by every person involved, regardless of who is more to blame, there is enough blame in this to go around. Absolutely. I mean, whatever whatever the facts are, you know, in this, there's a lot of allegations and everything we've said tonight, we should probably point out, you know, are allegations at, at this, this point. point. You know, just reporting on, on what others have reported so far. It's all allegations, but, you know, there are through lines like the dog being rescued. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny getting bitten and uh, Jackson getting a chair to the face, you know. <laughs> Those things seem to be consistent throughout, but <laughs> oh, man. A, a botch all around. I agree. You know, I, I the the problem I have here is I really love CM Punk as a wrestler. I really I really love the elite. Uh, and everybody is just very. I really love AEW. Very, I really <laughs> love AEW. Everybody's really raw and very human. I mean, Punk said, "I'm old. I'm hurt. I, I'm grumpy. I'm human." Whatever he said <laughs> when he ended it, I don't even remember that. But he had a muffin in his mouth when he said it. <laughs> it's Tony begged for water. Can I have this? No. Please, more water. More water. Oh, poor Tony. I mean. Tony apparently regained his composure at some point and said, okay, I've got to do what's best for business. I've got to do my McMahon thing now and and let everybody that know that nobody is bigger than AEW, even the E in AEW, you know, and we've got to do some course correction here. But that's my botch. That's your botch. <laughs> and I know you want to finish strong, so you tell me. You want to go performance or match, whichever one you want to do first. So I'm gonna I'm 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 just gonna do one two here, man. First okay. of all, let's, let's go performance. Oh, uh, after all this hot mess that was AEW and, and All Out's media scrum. I mean, the pay per view itself was great, but you know, there there became a whole bunch of will they, won't they, what happens next? MJF, who was it was almost that you know, for MJF, his return gets lost. Yes, but at least they opened with MJF on Wednesday night. MJF. Playing MJF greatly, Mox comes out and Mox, you know, punctuates things. And I have to give a, a, a shout out proper to John Moxley for coming back and doing hitting just seriously hitting a reset button on the entire show, on the entire wrestling nonsense that had happened up to that point, and saying, "Here's where we are. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's why I'm going to do it." And putting over every competitor, not burying anybody, but putting over everybody in the championship and just just being a class act and just doing a full reset. You know, that this man above all else right now in that company, with the exception of maybe Jericho, <clears throat> you know, are the top assets to get out there and be the, and be the faces of this company. 
And then on top of that, I'm just going to go straight into match. Garcia, Yuda, RRH Pure. Unreal. Yeah. Unreal. And that's all I got. You go. <laughs> so I was t- torn. I'm glad that you called out John Moxley because I, I almost went this performance of the week WWE by not being AEW <laughs> for the week. Uh, <laughs> And but John Moxley did come and he restored order and he he came out and and proved himself to be someone possible to be the face of a company, not necessarily the most obvious person to be a face of a company, uh, considering his rough and tumble sort of backstory and and character. But uh, maybe in this chaotic time, it's what you need. He canceled his vacation. Uh, he was supposed to legitimately be on vacation, but because he was needed, he showed himself a good soldier and company man by showing up and doing what he did. So kudos. Uh, I'm giving my performance of the week to Hangman Page simply for having the good sense or good fortune uh, for being gone bef- from the area before Punk's media scrum appearance uh, because of his association with all of the others involved, as well as Punk's comments burying him. It's very likely he would have been in the middle of all that and amongst oh, all of those that are suspended and maybe even on their way out of the company. And so kudos to, to him and lucky for us, the hangman page uh, got spared from this awful, awful uh, mess. Uh, and then for match of the week, so much great wrestling overshadowed by Punk's stupid mouth. But there, that was the the great uh, Garcia Yuta match that you called out, which I'm glad you did. Swerving our glory versus Acclaim. They actually stole all out. Mm-hmm. Uh, the phenomenal Ricochet Carmella Hayes match, which almost stole the weekend very quietly by being part of an afternoon show on uh, NXT Worlds Collide. Um, and then, of course, the big main event we talked about that was amazing from Clash at the Castle, which Roman and, and uh, um, Drew put on a great show. I am actually going to go with the secondary title that was defended on uh, there in Wales, and that was the internet, uh, intercontinental title match between Gunther and, and Sheamus. These two beat the living crap out of each other in an instant classic you know, 35, whatever year, 35 ish years or whatever it was from the day that another physical encounter was had for the intercontinental title that stole the show there in Wembley between uh, Hitman and, and uh, Davy boy. And I thought that was just a great call out to have the intercontinental title of all things that needs elevated, be elevated by these two warriors and a must see match. It was good stuff. Absolutely. I cannot disagree. There was no good stuff. <laughs> Almost too much good stuff, Doug. Because uh, we're we're having so many fun. We're running along. <laughs> here's the thing, man. The world is an awful place. Wrestling should not be awful right now. I mean, this is an escape for so many of us. If you're unhappy, man, do something about it. Talk to your boss. Don't talk to your boss and a, a room full of press and yell at your bosses and tell you tell them they can't even manage a target. <laughs> That's not the way to get business done either. I mean, you know, don't go into business for yourself. And this is for everybody out there. Slow down. Talk to people. Don't bite any humans. Don't Don't bite any humans. humans. Rescue dogs. Do that. That's good. (laughs) But, you know, wrestling should be fun. We should have smiles on our face like this goofy fool right here all the time when we're talking about wrestling. Be nice to each other. My goodness, it can't be that hard. We are going to be talking about wrestling again, Doug. Not on Sunday next week. Uh, we are delaying our, our normal Sunday show to go live post Dynamite on September 21st. So join us Wednesday night when Dynamite ends. We are going to give the entire hour. We're not going to do uh, the big finish of the main event, uh, or I'm sorry, big finish or opening bell because we'll be having a show on Sunday as normal that very week on the 25th. But we're back with you on the 21st to talk specifically about where this currently stands we need more info you need more info we may have it by that time we will give you an update as to where everything stands and then go into a deeper analysis as just as how this is going how this happened and what if anything tony can do to right the ship we have some we have some opinions on this as i'm sure you all do as well and i will say a plug if we didn't intend for this doug to be a a a a series on the uh, end of uh, uh, AEW. But uh, if you want to see part one of the story, 
go back and watch our episode from a couple of weeks ago where we talk about the uncertain future of AEW. We were only looking, not at the creative side, we were only looking at the business side and the merger that they're having to deal with and whether or not they're going to get a, a favorable contract uh, out of this or any contract out of this to keep the product on television. That is further complicated now by everything that's come hint. So it's really a one-two. Go back and watch that episode and join us for the special. I got nothing else tonight, man. <laughs> Be nice to each other. Come Be on. Nice to each other. Watch some wrestling and uh, watch those muffins, the high in <laughs> calories and, and lead to bad attitudes. <laughs> Apparently they do. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching.